I will. I was going to, there you go. Kevin is so good. Thank goodness for Kevin. Okay, everybody, let me just set this up. So tonight, we are so excited to have you all here to be diving into this amazing content and to be so honored to have Professor Foner with us. So real quick introductions before we dive into that. Our, you know, our, our VIP, our guest star of the evening is Professor Foner. He's DeWitt Clinton Professor Numerous at the College of Columbia. He's a great friend of the Constitution Center and one of our favorite scholars, if not our favorite scholar. Um, and we just find him the most interesting and entertaining and his books are fantastic. So we'll turn it home over to him really quickly. But the person that really gathered us here all together about a year and a half ago at this time is Dr. Michelle Herzog. So Michelle, let me turn it over to you to say hello to everybody. And then we'll run through the NCC team and go from there. Yeah, great. Thanks, Carrie. I'm really excited, honored to be part of this project. I'm with the Los Angeles County Office of Education, and I'm happy to see my colleague from LACO is here, Craig Lewis. Give a wave, Craig. Um, and together, we're trying to do the good work that you're all doing, trying to support and strengthen history, social studies, education uh, across LA County and wherever we can reach. So we're grateful to you, Carrie, and the team for this collaboration. It's been wonderful. Hope it can continue. And yeah, so excited to see Dr. Foner again. He's one of the best and all of his books are wonderful too. If you haven't picked <laughs> up one or several, they're great. So thank you. I wanna know who else is here from California. I'm anxious to see, but it's great to have everyone together and gosh, I hope you're all doing well. It's a tough time. So thanks, Carrie. Yeah, and Michelle, thank you for pointing that out. We thank you all the teachers for everything you do every day, but also coming tonight. So if there's oh, anything yeah. you need, you put that in the chat. We're here to help answer questions, but also make this a fun and interesting and entertaining night. If you don't know me already, hi, I'm Curry Sautner. I'm the Chief Learning Officer at the National Constitution Center, and I get the lucky job of just gathering great people together and having conversations and listening to amazing stories. And I have amazing support from our team, and one of our team members is here tonight. Kevin, I'll turn it over to Kevin real quick. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to see you. My name is Kevin. I'm the Education Coordinator at the National Constitution Center. I've been with the center for almost 10 years. Uh, one of my primary jobs right now is working on the peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. Um, and I see uh, Chris Duggan is with us as well. He's one of our scholars for those sessions. Nice to see you, Chris. Um, and Dr. Funner, as always, it's so nice to see you. Thank you for being here again. So I'm so excited to learn with all of you this evening um, and looking forward to a wonderful session. And everybody, we are going to go through a few things tonight, starting with our lecture, and I will put everything, including the recording, on this PowerPoint that I just dropped in the chat was the bit.ly for it. So you don't have to take notes. We're going to take them for you, and we'll get the recording and everything going. So without further ado, let's turn it over to Professor Froner, and you can already hear the fandom that's going on in History Nerdville right now. So Professor Froner, all you, thank you. Well, thank you for all those kind remarks. I'm always happy to uh, speak, even <laughs> virtually, uh, at the National Constitution Center. Um, let me just uh, reiterate that, you know, I will talk for a while, uh, probably around after 40 minutes or something, we'll open for questions uh, for a while. So please feel free as we uh, later on to raise questions or make comments or whatever you wish to do. I think Kerry will sort of moderate that, um, that discussion. Um, I, let me just also quickly mention that, um, like many uh, millions, millions of people, I uh, had a touch of COVID a couple of weeks ago. But uh, it, as they say in the press, it seems to be true. If you've been vaccinated, it's a pretty mild case. Uh, the only reason I mention this, I'm, I think I'm basically recovered, but um, I still have a bit of a hoarse throat, so if my voice begins to uh, give out later on, you'll uh, know why. Um, anyway, um, as everybody knows, the Civil War and Reconstruction uh, transformed American society in innumerable ways, but the um, perhaps the most tangible legacies of that era are the three amendments that were added to the US Constitution, the 13th, 14th, and 15th, which I know very well the National Constitution Center spends a lot of time uh, dealing with explaining and discussing. Um, the amendments wrote a new definition of American citizenship and the rights it entails into the Constitution, forged a new relationship between individual Americans and the national state, 
and um, really uh, were the, tried to deal, at least in a beginning way, with the legacy of slavery uh, in, this, uh, in this country. So profound were these changes that the amendments should be seen not just as an alteration of an existing system, but as what uh, Carl Schurz, a leading Republican of that time, called a constitutional revolution. Um, <clears throat> or as I called it in my most recent book a couple of years ago, a second founding, the really the rewriting of the Constitution to make it fundamentally different in important ways than it had been uh, in its original uh, form. Yet the founders or the framers, let's say, of the uh, uh, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are not exactly household names. People like John Bingham, James Ashley, unlike the founders of 1787, uh, these, uh, uh, these members of Congress who wrote and ratified the um, uh, amendments are really not very widely known, unfortunately. In fact, Reconstruction is not very widely known in many ways. Just the other day, the uh, Howard Zinn Education Project up in Boston uh, issued a study where they had looked at the uh, standards, the, the history standards for all 50 states and interviewed teachers all around the country. And they concluded that very little time is sent on, spent on reconstruction in uh, classrooms, whether it's high school or middle school, early uh, education, et cetera. Now that may not be true for the people uh, who are here tonight because you obviously have an interest in reconstruction and I hope um, we can all persuade other teachers that it is important. Why, why in fact, does Reconstruction matter? Uh, the fact is that it is part of our lives today, in what, even if we're not uh, really um, aware of that, because key issues facing American society right at this moment, uh, literally at this moment, be, uh, um, are Reconstruction issues. Uh, who should have the right to vote? That is being fought out in the Senate as we speak here. Um, what is the federal government's responsibility for protecting the right to vote? Who should be a citizen in this country? That's being fought out on our border uh, with Mexico. How do we deal with homegrown terrorism, domestic terrorism? The United States first faced that in significant ways during Reconstruction via the Ku Klux Klan and kindred uh, organizations. Uh, the events of January 6th, a year ago, uh, were preceded a uh, hundred and some odd years later, uh, earlier, by uh, riots in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, or earlier in New Orleans, the Colfax Massacre. Uh, January 6th was not the first time that white supremacist mobs uh, tried to overturn a democratic uh, election. Uh, and of course, every session of the Supreme Court adjudicates cases requiring the interpretation of the 14th Amendment. So you can't really understand American society today without knowing something about that era uh, a century and a half ago. Reconstruction is also a prime example of what we might call the politics of history. I don't mean whether the historian is a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, I mean the ways in which historical interpretation both reflects and helps to shape the politics of the time the historian is writing. For most of the 20th century, as you all know, writing on Reconstruction was dominated by what we call the Dunning School, uh, named after William A. Dunning, my predecessor long ago, teaching at uh, Columbia University. And in the Dunning School's view, Reconstruction was the lowest point in the saga of American democracy. It was a time of misgovernment and uh, corruption uh, caused by the misguided decision to grant the right to vote to black men. The basic foundation of the Dunning School was that African Americans are simply congenitally incapable of intelligently taking part in political democracy. So giving them the right to vote unleashed all the so-called horrors of uh, Reconstruction. And this interpretation dominated uh, historical uh, scholarship, legal thinking, uh, uh, for over a century and survives to this day in popular historical consciousness. Uh, the Washington Post, not the Washington Post, the American Conservative magazine just recently had an article just rehashing 
the uh, Dunning School's attacks on Reconstruction. Uh, I was astonished to see this since no historian actually holds these views anymore, but it is still uh, out there. Um, why did this view of Reconstruction last for so long and in so dominant a way? Well, the reason was, here's the politics of history, it um, harmonized with the racial system of the United States from 1900 until the civil rights era of the 1960s, because this view of Reconstruction had clear political lessons to, to be taught. The first was it was a mistake to give black people the right to vote. And therefore the white South was correct or justified in taking away the right to vote as they did around in the era around 1900. Uh, secondly, Reconstruction was imposed by Northerners, outsiders. Maybe some of them were well motivated, but the, but the result proved that outside that the white South should resist uh, outside calls for change in its racial system. In other words, this view of Reconstruction was part of the legitimation of the Jim Crow system. In fact, in 1944, in his famous book, An American Dilemma, Gunnar Myrdal noted, he said, quote, when pressed about the black condition, white Southerners will regularly bring forward the horrors of Reconstruction. If you gave Black people their rights again, more horrors of Reconstruction would follow. Now, when the Civil Rights Movement came along, this the edifice of this whole interpretation fell to the ground uh, because of its fundamental racism. And today, I think most historians uh, see Reconstruction as um, a noble, if not successful, effort to establish for the first time in American history an interracial democracy, uh, a precursor of the modern civil rights movement, sometimes called the Second Reconstruction. Not everybody accepts this. In fact, um, not that long ago, around the year 20, uh, around 20 years ago, um, uh, Chief, then Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote a little book about the disputed election of 1876, which uh, ended Reconstruction. And uh, that book, uh, I have to say, was worthless as history. He may be a good jurist, but he knew nothing about American history. Um, but um, in it, uh, Rehnquist said that the 14th Amendment and other measures were just the product of Northern vindictiveness. They wanted to punish the South for the Civil War. It's an interesting thought that the Chief Justice of the United States saw expanding the rights of black people as punishing white people. It's like there was a kind of a, what do they call it, a zero sum uh, game here. If one group gets more rights, that must take something away from other rights. That's the Chief Justice. So you might therefore not expect him to be very uh, uh, open-minded about utilizing the 14th Amendment to expand the rights of uh, African Americans or others. Now, one has to remember when thinking about Reconstruction, the status of African Americans when the Civil War broke out. There were around 4 million slaves in the United States in 1860, as you know. Slavery was powerful, expanding, economically thriving. There were more slaves in the United States in 1860 than at any other date in our history. Slavery was embedded in the political system and the Constitution. The Washington Post just recently published a very interesting uh, uh, long research article showing that I think, um, uh, I'm not quite, 17,000 or something like that, members of Congress during American history were slave owners at some point in their life. Before the Civil War, basically about half the members of Congress were slave owners. But into the 20th century, people who had been slave owners were still sitting in Congress. It's just a sign of the political power of uh, slavery. Um, on the eve of the Civil War in the Dred Scott decision, the Supreme Court declared that a black person could not be a citizen of the United States. Slavery, in other words, shaped the whole, the really the definition of American nationality, identifying Americanness with whiteness. Uh, that's the Dred Scott decision. Uh, the only group before the Civil War that advocated a non-racial basis 
for nationality were abolitionists, black and white. Black political gatherings before the Civil War consciously chose to call themselves conventions of colored citizens. In other words, they claimed a citizenship status that the courts refused to them. Uh, but that laid the groundwork for what happened uh, in Reconstruction. In her memoirs written in the 1890s, the feminist uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton recalled that Reconstruction, quote, involved the reconsideration of the principles of our government and the natural rights of man. The nation's heart was filled with prolonged debates in Congress and legislatures, in the pulpits and public journals, and at every fireside on these vital questions, every fireside. This is what I call in my book, popular constitutionalism. Reconstruction was a time when interpretation of the Constitution was being debated up and down the society, not just in obscure places of lawmaking, but every fireside. Uh, these were fundamental issues to people in the aftermath of the Civil War. Now, let me talk for a minute about the three constitutional amendments. The first was the 13th, ratified in 1865, which irrevocably abolished slavery throughout the United States. It introduced the word slavery for the first time into the Constitution. The original framers had avoided it. They used circumlocutions like, um, uh, you know, persons held to labor, things like that, or other persons. Um, but um, in the act of abolishing it, the 13th Amendment named uh, slavery. And it said that, um, well, actually, why was the 13th Amendment necessary anyway? Uh, hadn't Lincoln freed the slaves in his Emancipation Proclamation? Well, yes, on January 1st, 1863, President Lincoln declared free over 3 million slaves. But the proclamation left in bondage about three quarters of a million other slaves in the four border states, the slave states that remained in the Union, uh, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri. Uh, moreover, while freeing individuals, and that's what the proclamation did, it did not abrogate the state laws that established slavery. Slavery is created by state law. To get rid of it, you've either got to repeal those laws or have a constitutional amendment that overrides them. In other words, Emancipation is not quite the same thing as abolition. The final language after much debate of the, of the 13th Amendment was taken almost word for word from the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, uh, which was based on a previous ordinance written by Thomas Jefferson in 1784. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime uh, shall exist within the United States. Now that little criminal exemption, except as a punishment for crime, uh, is a good uh, illustration of the aphorism that historians write with one eye, or maybe two eyes, on the present. For decades, scholars writing about the 13th Amendment, including me, ignored that phrase, except for punishment for a crime, just ignored it. And so did most contemporaries debating the 13th Amendment at the time. Uh, but with mass incarceration having become a major problem or question in our society, uh, it has a the criminal exemption has attracted uh, a lot of attention. Why was it in there? Uh, it's, it's hard to say. Um, actually, by the time of the, of the um, <laughs> of the 13th Amendment, um, it had become almost boilerplate. That is virtually every state in the North that barred slavery included some such um, provision allowing for the involuntary servitude of prisoners. Now later, un in an unanticipated way, this would become the basis for a giant system of convict labor in the Jim Crow South, where uh, uh, Black people were just uh, convicted of petty crimes, thrown into state penitentiaries, and then leased out to work on plantations or railroads or mines or lumber businesses, uh, 
to least out to uh, entrepreneurs, businessmen, etc. Um, this was not on the minds of Congress since uh, 1865, uh, but uh, it's an example of how unintended consequences of constitutional language can sometimes have uh, very far reaching effects. Now, despite that, uh, abolitionists saw the 13th Amendment as the beginning of even deeper transformation, what might today be called regime change, transforming a pro-slavery regime into a regime based on freedom. Most Republicans were not abolitionists, but they agreed on certain principles. One, slavery had caused the war and the death of over 800,000 Americans. Slavery had done more than oppress slaves. It was a cancer that degraded white labor and threatened all Americans' essential liberties. The 13th Amendment intended to change all this and more. Unlike the Emancipation Proclamation, it applied to the entire country. Um, and in one respect, at least, it was truly revolutionary. It abolished the largest concentration of property in the United States without monetary compensation. It's hard to think of another revolution, maybe the French Revolution or the Russian Revolution, where such a giant amount of property was just wiped out legally without any payment to the uh, former owners, but that's what the 13th Amendment uh, did. But if it resolved the fate of slavery, uh, the abolition of slavery opened up a host of other issues. What exactly was being abolished? Property in man? Well, yes. What about the racism inseparable from slavery? Was that being abolished? And if so, how? What would be the status of the former slaves in American society? These were the questions on which Reconstruction uh, persistently turned. Now, white Southerners had their own answers, as became clear when Lincoln was assassinated and Andrew Johnson became uh, president. Once lionized as a heroic defender of the Constitution against the radical Republicans, uh, Johnson today has a strong claim to being considered the worst president in American history. Uh, there are some other contenders, but Johnson is a claimant, no question. Um, Johnson lacked all of Lincoln's qualities of greatness. He was deeply racist. He was incompetent. He had no sense of public opinion. He could not work with Congress. Johnson set up new governments controlled entirely by whites in the South, uh, which <coughs> excuse me, enacted new laws called the Black Codes, to define the freedom uh, former slaves now enjoyed. The laws gave blacks virtually no civil or political rights. They required all adult men to sign a year long labor contract with a white employer or be uh, convicted of vagrancy and sold off to work for someone who would pay their fine. Um, the black codes alarmed Blacks to begin with and alarmed Northern Republicans uh, into thinking that the white South was trying to reimpose slavery uh, in all but name. And in response, Congress in 1866 passed one of the most important laws in American history, the Civil Rights Act of 1866. The first law to declare who is a citizen of the United States and what rights they are to enjoy. It began by saying that anyone born in the United States except Native Americans are automatically citizens, birthright citizenship. <coughs> Native Americans were still considered citizens of their tribal sovereignty at that time. Birthright citizenship is an important principle. Uh, it's a statement that anyone can be a loyal American. Race, religion, national origin do not matter. It severs citizenship from race, overturning the Dred Scott decision, among other things. It's one of those reconstruction principles that remains controversial. What is the status today of a child born in the United States whose mother uh, is an undocumented immigrant? 
Well, if you know how to read, which many congressmen don't appear to know, um, you read, you'll discover that that child is unquestionably a citizen, anyone born in the United States. Um, the law, now, the, that's in the civil rights law. The same principle was then put into the 14th Amendment short, shortly later. But the civil rights law then went on to say that all these citizens have to enjoy basic legal equality. States can't pass one set of laws for black people and one set of laws for white people as they have actually just done. The Civil Rights Act does not <coughs> give blacks the right to vote, but it, it guarantees equality of, of civil rights, specifically the rights of free labor, the right to compete in the marketplace, to sign contracts, own property, sue and be sued, testify in court, all citizens must enjoy these rights the same as enjoyed by white persons. The concept of whiteness before the war, a boundary of exclusion now became a baseline. Before the war, if you had the word white in a law, it was excluding black people like white men can vote, to, you know, have the right to vote, et cetera. Now, everybody has to enjoy these rights the same as a white person. Whiteness became a kind of umbrella for everybody defining the rights that would no longer be limited by race. Andrew Johnson vetoed the Civil Rights Bill. It became the first important law in American history enacted over his veto. But a law can always be repealed, of course. So very quickly, uh, Congress put these principles and others into the 14th Amendment, the most important change in our a constitution since the Bill of Rights. Um, the 14th Amendment is the longest amendment ever added to the Constitution. It's very complicated and has been the subject of immense or in enormous uh, debate ever since it was ratified. It contains sections that were ultimately, that were very obscure, but recently have become uh, kind of in the news. Section two, a convoluted clause denying the right to, that, that took away some of the representation of states if they denied any group of males the right to vote. If they denied women the right to vote, as all states did at this time, there was no penalty. But if a state denied black men the right to vote, they would lose some of their representation in Congress. This has never been enforced, but in my humble opinion, it should be. Now, as states are taking away the right to vote from more and more people, this is still in the Constitution, folks, they should lose some members of Congress, according to Section 2. Uh, in fact, I am the uh, president of an organization, the Committee to Enforce the uh, Second Section of the 14th Amendment. Uh, it's not a mass movement. There's only one other member. Um, uh, uh, professor Gabriel Chin, a law professor at the um, uh, University of California in Davis. But we're hoping to build greater popular support. Um, I should add that the 14th Amendment very much alarmed the era's feminist movement because it introduced the word male for the first time in the Constitution. The Bill of Rights doesn't say if that male or female, the rights that are listed there are for everybody. But now, as I said, if you deny any men the right to vote, the state will lose representation in Congress. Then there's the third section in the news right now, literally in a lawsuit in North Carolina, which basically says that anybody who took an oath to support the Constitution, as most public officials or all public officials do, um, and then took part in insurrection or giving aid to the enemies of the United States, uh, that person loses the right to hold office unless allowed subsequently by Congress. Now there are people saying President Trump should be barred from, former President Trump from office because he certainly took an oath to support the constitution and then took part in or inspired insurrection. Um, there's a lawsuit right now in North Carolina about a member of Congress saying he should not be allowed on the ballot because he was one of the people who inspired the events 
of January 6th. Um, this uh, this uh, Section 3 has been enforced occasionally in Reconstruction against leading Confederates, uh, but it's only recently gotten uh, into <clears throat> political discussion. But the heart of the 14th Amendment is the first section. This <clears throat> begins with this principle of birthright citizenship and goes on to bar the states from abridging the privileges or immunities of citizens or denying to any person the equal protection of the law. Any person, not just citizen, everybody in the United States is to enjoy the equal protection of the law, citizen or alien. The word equal is not in the original constitution, except in a clause about what happens if two candidates get an equal number of electoral votes. The 14th Amendment makes the Constitution what it never had been. That is to say, a vehicle through which aggrieved individuals and groups who feel they're being denied equality uh, can take their grievances, their claims to court. And as I said, the language is race neutral. It applies to everybody, not just former slaves. Doesn't use the word black or anything like that. And in fact, in recent years, the 14th Amendment has been used to increase the rights of many groups which were not on the mind of Congress in 1866, most notably uh, gay men and lesbians, who uh, this was a 14th Amendment decision over Gefell some years ago, equal protection of the law, which uh, uh, barred states from denying gay people the right to marry. The first section of the 14th Amendment transformed Americans' relationship to their government. Or in the words of one editor at the time, it changed a constitution for white men into a constitution for mankind. That's why I call it a second founding. It's a new constitution after the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment also marks a significant change in the federal system. It not only put the concept of equal rights into the constitution, but empowered the federal government to enforce it. You can see the point I'm making if you compare the three amendments with um, the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. The first amendment begins with the words, Congress shall make no law, abridging the freedom of speech, press, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's pro it prohibits Congress from interfering with our civil liberties, the federal government. It has nothing to do with the states. Try to give a speech in South Carolina before the Civil War condemning slavery. That would be against the law. Well, didn't that violate the First Amendment? No, that's a state law. It's not, it has nothing to do with Congress, and states can do whatever they please, basically. But the 14th Amendment and the other two end with a section saying Congress shall uh, have the power to enforce this amendment. That from Congress shall make no law to Congress shall have the power. Now Congress is to oversee the states and to make sure that they do not violate this principle of the <coughs> equal protection of the law. In other words, the 14th Amendment made the federal government for the first time, in the words of Charles Sumner, the great senator from Massachusetts, the custodian of freedom. No longer was a powerful federal government to be seen as a danger to liberty. It was the states that were taking away the rights of uh, many Americans. The 14th Amendment said nothing directly about the right to vote, but, to, uh, but very soon after that, Congress in 1867 required that new governments be set up in the South with black men having the right to vote. And in the 15th Amendment, ratified in 1870, black male suffrage was extended to the entire nation. The 15th Amendment bars states from depriving any citizen of the right to vote because of race. Uh, this sounds very sweeping, and indeed it was, but it outraged the women's rights movement because it allowed restrictions on voting based on sex to remain in place. It did nothing to enfranchise uh, American women, and even regarding men, uh, radical Republicans preferred a positive statement of the right to vote, 
all male citizens age 21 or over have the right to vote. If that had been the 15th Amendment, it would have saved us a lot of trouble uh, uh, in the future, but it wasn't. And uh, the 15th Amendment is a negative amendment. You cannot deny someone the right to vote because of race. But what about other things that deny people the right to vote? Let's say literacy or property or education. Um, those are not barred by the 15th Amendment. And indeed, when the Southern states later on took away the right to vote, it was not by law saying black people can't vote. That would have been a violation of the 15th Amendment. It was through these literacy tests, understanding clauses, good character clauses, which ended up eliminating just about every black voter in the South. And the Supreme Court always said, well, look, it doesn't mention race, so these do not violate the uh, 15th Amendment. So the 15th Amendment could be too easily uh, circumvented. But the advent of black male suffrage inaugurated this period we call radical reconstruction, when new biracial governments came to power in the South, a massive, unprecedented experiment in interracial democracy. These governments had significant achievements. They established the region's first public school systems for blacks or whites. Uh, they helped to start rebuilding the Southern economy. Um, black families, often disrupted by slavery, were reunited. Uh, black churches became major institutions in the black community. Black men held office in Reconstruction uh, at every level of government, from of government, from two black senators from Mississippi down to hundreds, or indeed maybe two thousand uh, African Americans who um, held office, like uh, from justice of the peace all the way up to member of state legislature and things like that. This was a remarkable change in our political system. There had been, from my count, two black public officials in the United States in the period from the revolution to the Civil War. Now you had 2,000. That's uh, quite a remarkable change. Um, now, of course, the <coughs> problems facing African-Americans uh, were not just political and civil rights. Um, African-Americans came out of slavery with no uh, economic wherewithal, basically. The famous uh, demand for 40 acres and a mule, their claim that, uh, that with freedom should come some kind of economic foundation was never enacted by Congress. Um, but the political, rev you, you might say that the political revolution went forward, but the economic revolution did not. But the political revolution was dramatic enough that, as I mentioned, it inspired a wave of terrorism in the South by the Ku Klux Klan and other such groups. Uh, one by one, the Reconstruction governments fell by the wayside until by 1877, the entire South was back under the political control of white supremacist Democrats. And they were dominated until the era of uh, the civil rights movement. This was the system we call Jim Crow, whose pillars included racial segregation, the disenfranchisement of black voters, severe cutbacks in public education for blacks, a labor market in which good jobs were reserved for white employees, and policing the whole system, lynching the murder of over 3,000 uh, African Americans uh, in the South, uh, you know, illegal, unjustified murder by mobs, uh, which uh, was a major feature of the Jim Crow system. Now, didn't this system violate the Reconstruction Amendments, equal protection of the law, the right to vote? Ultimately, it fell to the Supreme Court to construe the constitutional amendments. And over time, the court played a key role in the long retreat from the ideals of Reconstruction. Uh, I can't go into all these cases uh, now. Uh, it wasn't all these uh, Supreme Court rulings didn't take place all at once. It was a whole series of cases uh, re starting during Reconstruction itself in 1873 with the slaughterhouse cases and going into the early 20th century with Giles v. Harris and others. But little by little, the Supreme Court acquiesced 
as the South stripped away these constitutional rights. The le one of the lessons here for us is that the Constitution is not self-enforcing. Somebody has to enforce it. Congress was supposed to enforce it. That's what the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments say. But ultimately, the Supreme Court has the final word, and it began declaring unconstitutional co congressional laws uh, trying to enforce the Reconstruction Amendments. It's worth noting that the Supreme Court's interpretation of these amendments was powerfully influenced by the emerging national consensus that Reconstruction had been a big mistake. Well into the 20th century, Supreme Court decisions reflected the Dunning School view of uh, Reconstruction. There was an alternative jurisprudence uh, that was also out there, uh, a, a group in um, Baltimore, a group of black lawyers, ministers, and others uh, published at the end of the 19th century a, uh, they called themselves the Brotherhood of Liberty, and they published a book called Justice and Jurisprudence, which called for a complete reinterpretation of the Reconstruction Amendments uh, and a much broader vision of national power to enforce the rights of American citizens, uh, challenging the way the Supreme Court had interpreted the amendments, but with to uh, no avail. Now, uh, one thing I would say about their, their view of these amendments is that they wanted there to be economic rights as well as the political and civil rights in the concept of American citizenship. They assailed employment discrimination, housing segregation, exclusion of blacks from labor unions. Can a citizen, the Brotherhood of Liberty asked, be daily excluded from the paths of industrial progress and yet be a citizen of the United States. Weren't these, wasn't the Jim Crow system a violation of the principle of equal citizenship? But as I say, the Supreme Court did not um, adhere to that view. Um, what's interesting here is that most of the Supreme Court cases of the late 19th century that overturned uh, the reconstruction, the principles of reconstruction uh, were never repealed by the Supreme Court. Plessy v. Ferguson, famous 1896, which said that state mandated racial segregation is allowable under the 14th amendment as long as the facilities are separate but equal. Plessy v. Ferguson was overturned by <laughs> the Brown v. Board of Ed decision of 1954. But most of these other cases are still on the books. Even the Warren Court of the 1960s uh, worked around these old cases rather than directly confronting them. Even the Warren Court could not bring themselves to say that for 80 years, the Supreme Court had just been wrong. Uh, wrong and racist, one might, uh, one might add. Um, and we live, of course, in a legal system based on precedent. So the fact that these precedents are still out there, the civil rights cases, uh, as I said, Giles v. Harris allowing the right to vote to be taken away, Slaughterhouse eliminating the privileges and immunities clause of the uh, 14th Amendment. The fact that these, that these decisions are still out there means in a certain sense that the violent overthrow of Reconstruction is still part of our legal system today, which is a kind of a, a melancholy thought. And I think given the nature of the Supreme Court today, I don't expect them to suddenly uh, rediscover uh, a different jurisprudence and bring that to fruition. So let me finish with just a couple of points and then we can take questions for a, a little while. First of all, we Americans sometimes like to think that our history is a straight line of greater and greater freedom. But actually, as Reconstruction shows, it's a more complicated story of ups and downs. Rights can be gained and rights can be taken away, uh, something that seems to be happening in many states uh, today. In his second inaugural address, uh, Abraham Lincoln identified slavery 
as the basic cause of the Civil War and implicitly challenged Americans to look, to think creatively about how to fulfill the aspirations unleashed by the destruction of slavery. And that challenge still faces us today. However flawed, in my view, the era that followed the Civil War, Reconstruction, can serve as an inspiration for those today trying to make this a more equal and more just society. So thank you very much for listening, and we will move along here to questions. Thank you, Professor Foner. I completely appreciate it. The chat has been filled with questions, but also just this is wonderful. This is wonderful. So thank you. I'll give you a minute to sip a water. <laughs> I also appreciate you doing this while you have a cold and COVID and also, you know, hard to it's see. It's really you. just a bad cold, but that's all right. I've, cool. I've, I've lectured <laughs> with a bad cold before. <laughs> so quite, uh, statement number one from Katie um, that I just have to share. She did Northwest Ordi Ordinance shout out. Thank you. Nobody ever talks about the Northwest Ordinance. And it's a, a great point. I appreciate it. And I do think it's fascinating that they, they use Jefferson words, but don't really tell you why. Um, the question around that, and you, you address this a little bit, but a question around that point is, how much did the writers of the 13th and the, the 13th Amendment in particular on this point worry about that, that loophole? Um, yeah. was, it, was it unknown to them or was it something that like, oh, this could go back? Well, it wasn't, on, it wasn't, it was there in the language. Anyone who read the 13th Amendment could see it. I think the, 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 the later history of the, of the Northwest Ordinance, I think, helps to explain this. In the 1850s, Republicans insisted that by trying to restrict the um, expansion of slavery into the West, they were following in the footsteps of the founding fathers, that the framers of the Constitution had meant to stop the expansion of slavery. Evidence for this was the Northwest Ordinance. Lincoln, in his great Cooper Union speech, spent a lot of time on the Northwest Ordinance because he said it proves that Republicans are not extreme radicals. We are the conservative group. We are trying to implement what the founders wanted. It's the Southerners who are trying to expand slavery who are the radicals here. So choosing the language of the Northwest Ordinance was almost second nature to Republicans. They, it, it's not that they didn't see that language, the, the criminal exemption language, but they just didn't register it as anything significant. Remember, there were hardly any prisons yeah. at this point. There were hardly any prisoners. And so the notion of a giant system of prisoners' labor just didn't occur. The one senator who said this may cause a problem was Charles Sumner, the abolitionist, who said, I don't think we could use this wording because it may lead to loopholes, et cetera. But the rest of the Congress said, no, this, this has been out here for 75 years or something, and it's in the constitution of many states and nothing bad has ever happened. So I think they just didn't take seriously the possibility of um, the rise of the convict lease system. People have difficulty predicting the future, unfortunately. Oh, great. Thank you for that clarity. I, and Kim kind of asked the question around that point. So with convict leasing and prison labor at this time, how does that not violate the 13th Amendment? Well, does it violate? I mean, <clears throat> you know, the courts have ruled that the, the, the convict leasing as in the 19th century sense doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. There is labor in prisons, though. And courts have ruled that, for example, prisoners are not entitled to the minimum wage, right? There's a minimum wage, but prisoners get, get, get paid much less than the minimum wage, if they get paid at all. Prisoners have no right to form a labor union. Most workers, at least on paper, the Wagner Act, have that right in this country. It doesn't apply to prison. So courts have certainly ruled not a giant system of unfree labor, but that certain aspects of the labor of prisoners are, which are allowed, which would not be allowed if they were not in prison. If, the, if applied to other people, the minimum wage would have to be, uh, you know, would have to be recognized. Um, so, you know, but it, 
it's, it's, so the whole question of prisons is now, you know, much more on the political agenda than it has been in our past. Sometimes you get the idea in some writings that the members of Congress in 1865 somehow planned to have convict lease. That's not true at all. There is no evidence whatsoever that any of them anticipated this. But certainly they should have been more careful in writing the 13th yeah. Amendment. Let's just put it that way. Or just listen to Sumner. Um, so I, the, and it's interesting because I just was listening to Clint Smith talk about Angola prison and the, the use of the convicts at that prison to make materials. I do think they're paid a base really small stipend and that they are paid a little around. bit but it exactly. does not have to be up to the minimum wage exactly so um next question Jeannie asks a great question and it's a part of the activity we're going to do later you know she works with fifth graders and loves the stories loves to share this content and wanted to know if you have any visuals that pop into your mind or you know we have an amazing tapestry at the constitution center that shows all of reconstruction and it's like a where's waldo of reconstruction so what would you suggest for visuals to support some of these stories? Well, that, uh, that's an interesting question. You know, many, we well, have yeah, a good number of years ago, back in the 1990s, I was a, a co-curator of a traveling exhibition on reconstruction that was shown at many museums and historical societies all around the country. And uh, it's full of interesting visuals of one kind or another, which I think even young children can find striking and dramatic and educational. <laughs> it's all been it's digitalized and is online. I recommend people just go and Google um, my website, which just ericphoner.com. Just go to that. And at the very bottom of the home page are links to two exhibitions that I curated. One is about the Civil War and one is about Reconstruction. Um, so you can just click on that and you get a gigantic array of images of Reconstruction uh, of all kinds. Um, so uh, there are plenty out there. Uh, and, and many of these images are, are really could be the basis of very interesting a conversation, images of slavery and freedom. In other words, how Reconstruction has changed people's lives, things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I, would, I would recommend just going to my website and clicking on the Reconstruction exhibit and you'll see plenty of images that you can utilize. And I think that's great. And I will tell everybody save that because you're going to be using it in about a half an hour. Uh, so Katie's question um, for Dr. Foner is, can you give some examples of the enforcement clause of the 13th Amendment and subsequent enforcement clauses on the 14th and 15th Amendment, examples of it being used throughout history? So where do uh, we well, see Well, that's, that's a good question. First of all, unfortunately, the 13th Amendment has pretty much fallen into abeyance. Um, the courts have ruled that basically the 13th Amendment's purpose was accomplished when slavery ended, and that's that. There's nothing more to be said. Um, now, Justice John Marshall Harlan, great justice of the late 19th century, who was the only member of the Supreme Court who was really passionately devoted to protecting the rights of the former slaves. And by the way, the only member of the court at that time who had actually owned slaves. He came from a slave owning family in Kentucky. Um, Harlan, um, insisted that uh, the 13th Amendment allows for very expansive congressional action to protect equal rights. The 13th, as part of the abolition of slavery, Congress had the right to abolish the badges of slavery, the badges and incidents of slavery. There's John Marshall Hall and uh, Ryan's, there he is, the great dissenter. Um, so for example, when Congress overturned the Civil Rights Act of 1875. The Civil Rights Act of 1875 had barred um, discrimination in public accommodations, transportation, things like that. Supreme Court said, no, this is no good because the 14th Amendment only talks about state action, laws. States can't, but this is just private businesses. No state can deny you the equal protection law, but it does not do with states. This is just private businesses discriminating. John Marshall said, this is a 13th Amendment case, not a 14th Amendment. This is about freedom. This is what it means to be a free American. You can't be subject to degrading 
discrimination in every aspect of your life and somehow be an equal American. So forget about the 14th Amendment. The abolition of slavery entitles Congress to abolish these badges of slavery. Later, uh, Congress, the, the Supreme Court did enforce uh, and Congress the, the, <clears throat> uh, the 13th Amendment through peonage laws. So that is to say laws prohibiting peonage in the, in the old Spanish areas of the Southwest in Arizona, uh, et cetera, there were instances of peonage. That is not slavery exactly, but being forced to labor to pay off a debt, okay? Um, Congress banned that with the Peonage Act of 1867. Later on, the Supreme Court upheld that under the 13th Amendment. This was involuntary servitude. If, you, if someone owes you money, you can sue them. You can't force them to work for you. Um, so, but, they, but mainly there has been very little. The, the, one other case, 1968, the, the uh, open housing case where the Supreme Court upheld a federal law banning discrimination in the private sale of real estate. Um, well, the Supreme Court said, well, that kind of discrimination is a badge of slavery. And therefore, the 13th Amendment allows Congress to abolish it. But no jurisprudence has followed after that, to my knowledge, uh, 13th Amendment. Um, 14th Amendment, there's a, <laughs> there's a million cases. Every case of the 20th century that was important seems to have been a 14th Amendment. And things having nothing to do with that, you know, race or something. One man, one vote, 14th Amendment, right? Uh, Roe v. Wade, 14th Amendment case. Uh, there are innumerable, uh, Obergefell, gay marriage, 14th Amendment case. Um, the, all these things have to do with state laws or state actions that differentiate in an unequal manner uh, among American uh, citizens. So the 14th Amendment has had far more jurisprudence than the 13th or the 15th. Uh, one could have a long discussion of that, but I think we're actually basically out of time. Um, and also my voice is beginning to give out. So I think I'm going to thank you all for listening and I wish you all luck in um, combating the finding of the Zinn History Project that Reconstruction is not taught in our schools. Uh, I, as I said, I think it's quite important that it is taught so that students can understand better some of the things that are happening uh, in our country right today. So thanks a lot. And I hope you appreciate the rest of the, uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you so much, Professor Foner. We appreciate you so much, all that you teach us. Always coming back to the NCC and working with our teachers for more and more and doing it on a hoarse voice. So thank you very much. Have a great night. Um, and we will see you again soon. And yes, okay. now the chat okay. is Okay, yeah, so you're, all, you're very welcome. Bye-bye, <laughs> everyone. Bye-bye. Awesome, everyone. Okay, as we...